I saw 20 new movies in the month of October. Am I crazy? Of course. Today we're going to rank them. Let's do it. What's up, Flick fans? Happy early Halloween. What a list. We've got a lot of movies to get through. Some horror films and some comic book movies. What was your favorite? What's your least favorite? What did I miss? I saw 20. I saw too much. I'm a psycho. <laughs> there is something that your daddy and I... There's something that want mommy and me want to, to, want to talk to you about. Start with Andrew Garfield, Florence Pugh. We live in time. This was, uh, it was a very moving and beautiful experience. I expected that from A24. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a schmaltzy, sad love story where something really bad happens or is happening to one of our characters. And we saw the trailer. We kind of know how this film goes, but the beautiful thing about it is it tells its story out of order. No chronological stuff here. Andrew Garfield's sad. Florence Pugh, well, she's sick. She's not feeling too good. Cough, cough. It gets worse. But the beauty of this film is it becomes very optimistic, right? They're handling this, what could be a horrible situation with such optimism and joy and the thought of one that Florence Pugh's character has in this film, I need to be remembered for something more, I think resonates so heavily as you're watching this. And man, there were a couple of moments where I'm just so invested in these two. I think that's a big part of why this works, right? You get two phenomenal actors, you get a very competent director and a script while not perfect, kind of knows what it's doing, what it's going for. So I think that's why this film worked for a lot of people. That's why it worked for me, and it handled it with such optimism, which is beautiful. We Live in Time is going on the great tier. It's a beautiful movie. Where are my emeralds? Go from husband and wife to two brothers, played by Josh Brolin and Peter Dinklage. They are playing... Brothers that are just kind of on a bad path, except at one point, Josh Brolin's character says, you know what, we're going to we're gonna turn things around and live a normal life until he's dragged right back into it. And the camaraderie between these two is good. I think the addition of some other really notable names, one being Brendan Fraser, who is hilarious often in this film. Uh, a lot of these things, I thought they would add some more substance and ultimately just a forgettable experience. It's trying to be like, at least since humor-wise, like an old brother or arc thou, where it's quippy and it tries to interject with humor and circumstances, situations that wouldn't really require humor in real life. And it it almost feels like, like what Logan Lucky was trying to do, a crime-based film with an incredible sense of humor, except I found Logan Lucky to be hilarious. I found old brother or arc thou to be hilarious. I found brothers to be, well, kind of like Wolves earlier this year, where you've got George Clooney, you get two big time actors, same case here. You've got a really good cast, same case here, but just it lacks style. It lacks almost anything notable about it. I, I didn't care about these characters. I cared more about the actors as the characters, but they don't do a good job of telling this story. And honestly, when the action was happening, I was kind of tapping out, right? There's some really good moments, but I have to say, Brothers was disappointing, and I'm going to say it's just one of those meh movies that I'm not going to remember. I need to understand it. Like you do. It's exactly why you shouldn't be here. How about Hellboy? The Crooked Man. Hellboy is an attempt at taking on the famous character that uh, they did a good job of in a couple of movies back in the day, but ever since then, we got a reboot with David Harbour. Now, another reboot with... Who, who is this? Jack Kessie and directed by Brian Taylor, who did Crank and Mom and Dad, movies with a ton of energy. And I, I'm watching Hellboy going, there's no energy here. And maybe it's because I'm used to the Guillermo del Toro uh, effect of the earlier films or just what Hellboy was in the comics, which is a lot different from that, right? He's changed in live action. Now, I will give this movie kudos for trying to capture some of that comic book magic of the dark and kind of more gritty version of the character, this horror type world that they're living in, even though they don't do a lot of world building here. It's really just one small situation and the crooked man and his sidekick. The acting's not very good. It does feel like a low budget B movie in that way. The effects, you don't expect them to be good. It's fine if they're not, but I just found this to be a really dull experience. And honestly, I was just kind of over it after about 30 to 45 minutes, nothing interesting happening. So I'm going to go Unfortunately, Hellboy on the bad tier. Mr. Crockett's world! A friend like you is a friend like me. Whenever you're a 
called Mr. Crockett. It's an evil version of Mr. Rogers. He comes out of the TV and attacks the children while they're watching. Well, he attacks the adults starting out in that first uh, sequence. I'm like, oh, okay, well, dad's kind of screwed. So. But this movie's about a son who gets kidnapped by this demonic entity known as Mr. Crockett, who uh, ultimately is showcased very well by Elvis Nolasco, who hams it up in the role, uh, comes across as very creepy, almost terrifying at times, but he never quite hits that level. They're definitely going for... We want this to be the next horror thing, obviously spoofing the obvious here, but uh, to be something special. And it falls short of that. I believe Mr. Crockett does a lot right in terms of low budget, awesome special effects, wacky moments. But then you've also got some off performances, some characters that I didn't find interesting. Mr. Crockett himself is great, and that was so much fun when that was happening on screen. But all the characters we're worried about, we're trying to care about in the story with the son, I'm just like, yeah, I've seen this before. Hope you find him, but I've seen it before. So, Mr. Crockett, I respect the attempt. I may be on an island here. I just didn't really like the movie itself. It's more so the concept that I'm intrigued by. So, yeah, I've got to go bad tier, but that doesn't mean I don't appreciate them for trying. About things that are so terrible. You'll run away until your brain won't remember. Staying in the genre, we have the Salem's Lot remake now. Got some pushback for this. I didn't hate this movie. I don't really remember the original Salem's Lot. I think that's where the disconnect is. If you've never seen Salem's Lot, you might watch this and be like, yeah, it's kind of creative. It's a little creepy. I, I like the characters in a way. It's more so you've got some big time actors as these characters. So, of course, you're going to get a kick out of some of them and their interactions. But... In all honesty, there are some moments that are actually kind of scary here and that kind of got me. People are getting mad that this movie's leaving out integral elements of the original, that the characters aren't as likable, and that there are definite cliches and conventions here. I get all of that, right? I am the king of pointing out those deficiencies in a horror movie, but I'm also the king of telling you all the truth. And to be honest... I had some fun with this. You what? You got Lewis Pullman, Alfre Woodard, Bill Camp. It's always a good day when Bill Camp is there. Also, Jordan Preston Carter, who played Mark. Mark is a great character uh, in the face of danger consistently throughout this movie and ridiculously entertaining. Their interactions are fun. You know, the dialogue, it's not great. And they make very dumb decisions. I think the decision making is the biggest issue in this film. And so... I understand where fans of the original are coming from. Absolutely, I feel that way about a lot of movies. Didn't bother me as much. I'm not saying it's the best film of the year. It's going on the okay tier for me. I need you to listen to me. Something really bad happened. Smile 2. Naomi Scott as Sky Riley. It's Sky Riley's world, folks. We're just living in it, and uh, she's struggling. In this film, the smile demons found her, and she's seeing things, a lot of things are not what they appear to be, and uh, her world's a little messed up, and it's kind of fun living in it, to be honest with you. I I've seen some people that have watched this and been like, yeah, the, the trope of, you know, living in this reality that doesn't exist, so we're constantly backtracking on what they're giving us, and that happened like 20 times in this movie. Admittedly, it did start to feel repetitive, but... I did like the twists and the turns, and ultimately, you don't really know what's real, and so you don't really know where this movie's going at all times. I appreciate that. You don't get that in horror movies nowadays, and Sky Riley, an entertaining character. The people around her just want to help her, well, kind of use her, but also want to help her, and bask in her success, but they're also thinking she's going a little crazy. Heck, I watched this movie, and I think she's going a little crazy, even though you've got a good reason to. The smile demon is fantastic. Also, the way this movie ends, while it's happened again in another horror movie that's not very good, I thought this handled it a lot better, and I responded to it, man. I'm like, all right, that's creepy. I love that it's creepy. And that one scene where everyone's together in the, in the, in the door and they're all crawling, that was cool. Never seen that before. That happened to me once on a Tuesday. So, Smile 2 is good, better than the first. The five-year anniversary is coming up. I think a lot of people would really like to hear from you after all this time. 
How about Terrifier 3? We're sticking in the horror world here. I believe there is so much to love about this movie when it comes to the practical gore, the incredibly violent moments with Art the Clown and his very creepy looking demonic sidekick. I loved the madness when they're on screen. Now, the story with our lead that carries over from Terrifier 2, I, I found the second film to be a lot better written than the third and the first, honestly. Uh, but this is one of those stories that you just, you're there because you want to see the kills. It's okay-ish. She's fine. She's seeing visions. She's living in her fears. Mike Tomlin says, don't live in your fears. She's doing it. Uh, but Art the Clown. Art the Clown is brilliant. Maybe not as many hilarious moments as Terrifier 2, but definitely some moments that were like, OMG, I can't believe they're doing this. If you don't like body horror, don't watch this film. Actually, you know what? Watch it. I want to see a reaction. Film your reaction. Send it to me via fax. All right, let's put Terrifier 3. Yeah, it's close. I could put it on the OK case here because of all of those story cliches, but because of it doing what it needs to do, I'm going good tier. Don't move. It's hard to do. This movie's weird. This movie is, and you know, honestly, it's very simple. It's a very simple premise. A girl gets injected with this stuff that is slowly shutting her body down, and she can't really move throughout most of the film. So it's an easy performance, but she does a lot of solid things with her eyes. You've also got some guy that's walking around and, well... He's kind of psycho. I'm a psycho. <laughs> and while Kelsey Asbill is very likable, it's Finn Wittrock that kind of steals the show here with his maniacal, uh, kind of on the edge of nature throughout the entire movie. And there are some moments with him and other characters that I just thought he did a, a very good job of. Um, the film is very simply written. It's competent. I do believe some of the character choices and decisions are like, what are we doing? And... If you're doing this earlier, why aren't you doing this now? If you're showcasing something to someone trying to survive, why aren't you doing the same thing over here? And so weird decisions, a very simple story that may have went on too long. That being said, it's only 90 minutes, so I can appreciate that as well. Don't Move does what it has to do. It didn't do too much more, but it takes a simple story and kind of runs with it. I'm going right next to Salem's Lot on the OK tier. Buenos días, vecinos. Un nuevo mes en el hoyo. All right, the platform two, I really wanted to like. I think the first one is extremely unique. It's doing what Snowpiercer is doing, dealing with themes and classism and what would happen if you drop food down and are they going to take the right amount of food for them? Or are they going to send it down to the next people to allow them to survive? That's interesting. And I think the first one handles that in a simple way. The platform two tries to be bigger and their belief is that it will make it better. While watching this movie, it becomes a little too convoluted and obsessed with its own ideas to where it almost forgets to tell a, a compelling story individually, like with our characters and uh, with the relationships and dynamics. I do love the religious aspect and the, the guy who's kind of sacrificing certain things and people following that mindset and how they're, they're tearing each other apart in here and trying to figure out who do we follow, who do we listen to, like that's all interesting. But there wasn't really a character that I gravitated to. There wasn't a relationship that I cared about and there wasn't a dynamic in this movie that was interesting as opposed to the first with that main relationship that I was super attracted to. I also like what they do with where this takes place. That was creative, but ultimately, I was just kind of sitting there going, I just think they're trying to do too much. And that's that's what a lot of studios do with sequels. That being said, the platform two is going on the meh tier. Some interesting ideas. Hey, my darling, if you knew fate would be true. How about Outside? This is a Filipino horror movie that uh, came out on Netflix. Didn't know a lot about it, but I saw a lot of people talking about it. And the chatter had me intrigued. Now, this is a zombie movie. And so we don't really know when or where or why. We just know that this family is trying to escape uh, some creepy things happening. But ultimately, they're really trying to escape the madness within their family. It's a family drama with an apocalyptic 
backdrop. And that is intriguing. Now, you know, ultimately, I believe it falls a little flat because it takes a lot of time and deals with elements that feel repetitive in that first 45 minutes. And I'm sitting back going, all right, and I know this is a cool idea. It's like, let's try to be, let's try to do like Minari with zombies. Let's let's attempt to do that. Very different, but in that vein. Uh, Is it going to be like Parasite? No, it's not that deep. But ultimately, I'm sitting here going, where's the zombies? Can Can we throw some zombies in there, make this thing a little more interesting? It gets more interesting in the second half. It gets more interesting because of the, the the violence and the gore and that kind of thing, but also because of where those dynamics take our characters. And so that got more interesting and it kind of delivers a satisfying and shocking, I mean shocking, conclusion that did make all of my faults a little bit better because I was really struggling in the first half, but I, I can respect what this film is trying to do. It's trying to be a different type of zombie movie. It has a little Walking Dead with it, and no World War Z. It's not that kind of an action film, so don't expect that going in. But I'm going to put it on the OK tier because it really does try. All right, how about Family Pack on Netflix? This is like French Jumanji. They are playing this board game. The family, you know, they're not getting along. Some family issues, some things going on. And all of a sudden, they are there. They are within this old-fashioned village where things, well, it's a lot different than present day. And this movie's surprisingly mature. I guess I compare it to Jumanji, but it's actually, I believe it is rated TV mature. So there's a little bit of a horrifying aspect to what they're going through. They're watching people get beheaded and, you know, women taken into custody if they say something negative about their husband. Honey, you want to play a board game? She would have been in prison a long time ago if that was the case. Honey? I also have some recognizable faces here. You'll recognize the character of Gilbert, who in my opinion was the most entertaining. Maybe that's because I recognize the actor. But all in all, this is a family with their fair share of differences. They're having to get past that and figure out how to survive living in the Elden times when they don't have an Elden mentality. But they also have powers. You've got a werewolf somewhere in the midst of our group, somebody who's able to read the other person's mind. You've got a wizard. All sorts of fun things here that you can apply to board games, but that you can also apply to these characters and this movie. I do wish, you know, the family dynamic had a little bit more depth to it. It's a lot of surface level issues that we're never really able to dive into. There's some comedy here and there are some fun moments, but all in all, I just think the writing falls short of what the concept of this movie is. You know, Family Pack, it could have been a lot worse. I'm going to put it on the meh tier. woman of the hour. I love a good serial killer, crime thriller, something that's based around a true story, but this film decided to go a different direction than what I expected. So there's a game show, right? Here's my pitch for the movie. There's a game show, and on that game show, there's a bunch of guys or a girl trying to figure out which one out of these guys she's going to go on a date with. Well, one of those contestants is this murderer, and this actually happens. So That in itself is a fascinating story. I thought Kendrick did a really good job behind the camera. Although there were some things about this story that I feel like they could have put less emphasis on and then focused more on our killer here who is expertly played by Daniel Zavato. He's got that really subtle mannerism of, oh, this guy seems like a cool dude. Oh, wait, no. The way he moves his eyes and the way he reacts subtly in certain moments, I'm like, no, that guy's going to kill that girl. And sure enough, right, we cut to moments and instances of his victims, but we also get that interaction with Anna Kendrick, and that was the focus of the movie. Now, I don't know if I would have spent as much time there, because we build up her character a lot. I'm not necessarily sure if we needed that as much as we did a little bit more for him, and so the balance is is a tiny bit off, but for a first-time director and Anna Kendrick, great job. Really good performances, all in all, an impactful movie because what he did was devastating. So I have no choice. I've got to put Woman of the Hour on the good tier. Some cool decisions. Well, you had mentioned that we might be playing some games tonight. Mm-hmm. Do you still want to play games? Yeah, I want to play games tonight, man. Sticking with the creepy movies on Netflix, this one's not based on a true story. At least I hope not because it's got a sci-fi twist to it. A bunch of young adults get together and... Uh, 
They're basically going in and out of each other's bodies. And I don't mean that in a literal sense. Get your mind out of the gutter, you disgusting creature. No, I mean their consciousness is being shifted around into each other's bodies. And they're making a game out of it. They're kind of getting addicted to it. The sensation of it all. That's why it reminds me of... Talk to Me, I believe that's the name, uh, the A24 film, the horror movie. This isn't as far horror. It's more so you're kind of wondering what's the point of all this until you realize, oh, that's the point of it all. And while I don't think the ending completely nailed it, I do believe there were some really cool things about this movie. Trying to figure out, and they're making a game out of it, right? Who's in whose body? Okay, this is fun. But is there an ulterior motive at play that was pretty cool, as well as some of the performances, as well as the vibe of this movie, which at first, like, right, it's a standard Netflix weird, like it's going to be silly, you got the text messages appearing on screen, it's going to be like, no, it's not like that at all, it gets way more interesting, and it'll make you think a little bit about what those motivations entail, and so It's What's Inside was a cool movie. I haven't seen anything like it all year. It could have went the extra mile. It could have given more depth to our characters. But all in all, I was satisfied. That's what she said. And so I'm going to throw it right next to Woman of the Hour on the good team. 20 years ago, my sister and three other students were murdered. All right, if you've really paid attention here, you notice the Easter egg pop up. That is time cut. I forgot to throw time cut on this list. Because I literally just watched it, which makes you think, maybe I should have remembered that first, but I'm stupid, so. So it's not 20 movies, it's 21 movies. I told you I'm a psychopath, I've got to throw it on here because, well, it's rough. It's a rough movie to get through, man. I, I, I thought it would be more like Totally Killer, and the idea is like Totally Killer. People are calling this a Totally Killer ripoff. Guess what? This actually was made before Totally Killer, even though Totally Killer... Even though it was made second, does it all a lot better. I found that movie to be cute. Not great, but cute. This had the opportunity to be cute. I like the people involved. I'm a huge Griffin Gluck guy. Anytime Griffin Gluck's on screen, I'm like, I like that guy. It feels like he'd be a cool guy in real life. But you know what? The movie's not good. It's just not good. They go for a big rousing twist ending that didn't work. They have this girl traveling back in time to stop this murder, even though that isn't her motivation at first. The, the sisterhood, the, the bond between the two was nice, okay? There's some sweet moments, but it never commits to being a slasher. This is sold as a slasher, and there's barely any of that. And what we do get is so lackluster and lame and, okay, well, I'm not in it for that. I'm in it more for the sisterhood bond, the emotions that come from that. I don't think that was well written either. So pick your poison here. I just don't think this movie worked. A couple of charming moments, but that doesn't save it from going on the awful tier. This just uh, gets everything wrong. Operator 13, Anda ditugaskan menunggu sampai pemberitahuan selanjutnya. Commitment dan dedikasi. How about the Shadow Strays from the director of The Night Comes for Us on Netflix? I was a huge fan of that. I am a fan of this. I thought this worked extremely well. Now, it doesn't, I don't think it goes the extra mile. I've seen some people comparing this to John Wick, and I get it, right? The action sequences are amazing. Our lead character is so freaking badass, man. I loved her. I loved watching her. Although her motive, her motivation going after this, this young boy, it... I don't think it drives those emotions up as well as it could have. And frankly, the plot itself is generic. I mean, her motivation, you get it. But all in all, what we're dealing with here, the villains were cartoonish. I actually found that to be fun. They're very over the top. But when you get those fight sequences, they are awesome. And the creativity within the fight sequences, the filmmaking, the way that they showcase that, if you're in for some crazy action, that's what you're going to get. I believe the movie is too long. But I also love the time that we got to spend with our main character. I also, I could have watched this for 30 more minutes if there would have been more action because every time that's on screen, I'm captivated. I, I'm just thinking about how they made this. And yes, it's also very brutal, very bloody, everything you want in that department. And so I'm going to put the shadow strays. Yeah, I really want to go great tier. I'm going to go just below great tier, good tier, but it's very close. The Pope is dead. The Pope is dead in conclave. And Cardinal Lawrence, it's his job to elect a new one. And of course, with a movie like this, you're going to have strategy, 
allegiances, deception, uh, everything you want in politics. And this is about finding the next leader of these people. But they're going about it in such a strategic way. And again, the lies and all of the things that you expect in a movie like this, they are there. You could also relate that to real life politics because... Everyone's crazy. Then there's this conspiracy that our lead finds himself in the middle of, and all of these powerful people are in charge of electing this new leader. How are they going to go about that? I feel like I need to watch this movie again. I don't know if I was in the right mood. I don't know if I was just like, all right, it's, it's lasting a little too long, even though it's only really two hours. I love Edward Berger as a director. I really do. And I was... I was hoping this would be like a top five of the year for me. It's not that. And maybe that's on me. Because again, sometimes you walk into a theater and you're just you're just not feeling it. Now, I think this is a good movie. Absolutely a good movie. It's well directed. It's well written. I love the score. I don't know if everyone's going to like the score. I love the score. I thought it was outstanding. But I, I feel as if I was missing the main impact of the film. And maybe I'm just so sick of American politics. Maybe I just wasn't, you know, maybe after the election's over, I'll watch this again. That's probably come back to me after the election because I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the ads. I'm sick of the texts. I'm sick of the tweets. Uh, that that has nothing to do with this movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> I also feel like what Ray Fine's character is going through here, struggling immensely with his faith, the, the crisis, if you will, I feel like it was a little more generic than it needed to be. I mean, in a movie like this, you expect that to be one of the core struggles. It just, it didn't fully land for me. Look, the performances, John Lithgow, Ray Fi, I mean, you could go down the row, across the board, magnificent. And there are some subtly funny moments in this movie. It had a little bit of a sense of comedy, which I appreciated, as well as some shock, shock factor moments where I'm just like, oh, okay. But all in all... I need to think about this, and maybe I haven't had enough time to think about it because I just watched it a couple of days ago to get it on this list. I'm going to say, I think this will be an Oscar player. I'm going to throw it on the good tier with the caveat of I need to come back to it to see what happens. Look, my name is Lorne Michaels. I'm the producer of Saturday Night. The whole night? Yeah, the whole night. Chevy Chase, Gilda Radner. Saturday night, October 11th, 1975. You have all of these big-time stars that haven't, fully made names for themselves like this just yet, and they're all waiting for Saturday Night Live, the first episode of SNL. And this is the process that was building up to that, leading up to that, all of the NBC execs that said, yeah, we don't want to, this doesn't look like it's going to work. This doesn't feel like it's going to work. And then all of the famous, not at the time famous, now famous characters that you're just like, I can't believe all of the actors almost are nailing these performances. Gabriel LaBelle as Lorne Michaels. Uh, you have Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd. Dylan O'Brien's great. And I never saw him as Dan Aykroyd. I thought that was ludicrous casting. They also all look so young. But it's like, yeah, th that's the young versions of these characters. And everybody's really good in this movie. I mean, I mean some of the performances may be a little over the top, a little caricature, if you will, but it's the interactions, it's the dialogue, it's Willem Dafoe coming in as the NBC exec, it's J.K. Simmons coming in as, in as a recognizable face, and this is one of those movies you're like, I feel like this could have been Aaron Sorkin. If it would have been Aaron Sorkin, maybe these conversations would have been more impactful, would have lasted longer, stayed in the zeitgeist long after watching as opposed to right when you're watching. Uh, but all in all, this is well enough written, not an Oscar script, but it has that great sense of humor where everyone's back and forth. I mean, it's just firing on all cylinders. And I wanted to see what it was like with Lorne Michaels. According to some of the cast members, like Dan Aykroyd came out and said, yeah, it's not fully true, but they do a good job. And that's all I needed to hear, as well as a movie that just worked extremely well. So I'm going to say Saturday night. I had a great time with this. I'm going to put it on the great tier. You know, I always thought about what if life is like a Lego set and you can put it together. Admittedly, if piece by piece wasn't Lego, I don't know if I would have been enamored by this documentary. I probably would have said it's okay. It's a Pharrell documentary. You love Pharrell's music. It's lasted so long in the pop culture space, and he's got some great songs that make me happy. See what I did there? I would play it, but i get a copyright strike. That being said, the decision to make this Lego, what are we, what are we doing here? This is so weird. 
but so weird that it just might pay off and it does. Look, you've got a lot of stars across the board. You've got Gwen Stefani, Kendrick Lamar, Timbaland, Justin Timberlake, Jay-Z, Snoop Dogg, all those peoples, and they're in Lego form. But then you got Pharrell telling his story from when he was a childhood, how music spoke to him, and seeing all of this through this Lego animation is at times stunning. I mean, this is a colorful, beautiful movie that takes advantage of the music, plays off of it, and you get a pretty satisfying documentary. Look, the story itself, it's Pharrell's story, it's good, it's standard, but telling it like this, whoever made that decision is a genius. I'm going to say piece by piece is a good movie for sure. Let's hang on. There we go. Everybody's looking for a hero. Super man i finally watched it the christopher reeve doc i was so excited i wanted to go see it in the theater get, didn't get the opportunity critics choice sent me a screener i said thank you so much i'm going to check this out this instant and i did and it did everything I, I needed it to be again a story we've heard about a story that you know we've seen before in documentary form a tragedy if you will but also the hope the uplift that could come from the challenges that he faced and that he went through i'm a massive christopher ree fan always have been always will be you learned about his real life some of the struggles that he had with his marriage and his relationships and the divorce and but also what his kids went through and how they didn't see their dad a lot growing up but then that bond that they shared with him after his accident and the crazy part about this, when he had his role where he played a character similar to what he ended up circumstantially, I'm like, that's insane to me, but I loved it. I love seeing it. I love seeing Robin Williams' love for Christopher Reeve. I love seeing people in real life saying, you know, maybe Robin would still be here if Christopher was still here. Man, that was that was a tough moment. I'm getting chills just talking about Christopher Reeve's story. Uh, he brought hope to so many people, continued to bring hope until the day that he died, and I just loved I loved seeing that. I loved seeing that hope represented through him on screen, and I loved seeing his story and how he gave hope to so many people. And yeah, cliche documentary, sure, whatever. I don't care. It's all about the impact. It's all about how much you care, and I'm going great tier. Two years ago, the name Arthur Fleck hit Gotham like a hurricane. The trial of the century. They believe Arthur Fleck to be some kind of martyr. All right. Joker, Foley ado. Yeah, you know... This is, um, this stinks. This stinks. I want, hey, look, it's the picture that's been up the whole time. I wanted this to be so much better than it was. And initially I walked out of the theater and I said, I know I didn't like that, but I don't think I hated it. And I still don't hate it. I've seen worse comic book movies. But ultimately, when you look at what the first movie did, how fans loved it, how audiences loved it, how it, it sent... Maybe the wrong message to some people, but I feel like that got overblown, man. And I think a lot of that, honestly, I'll put it on the critics. I think critics were freaking out about the message of Joker. But I honestly don't, I think they misinterpreted the film. I really do. I believe a lot of people misinterpreted Joker and were stressing out about the gun violence in Joker. And I'm just like, guys, how many movies have we seen with this type of thing? How many movies, how many superhero movies? I mean, right after Joker came out, Harley Quinn came out. She was shooting people. There was gun violence. I mean, nobody said anything about Harley Quinn, but yet Joker, they're freaking... It doesn't make any sense. The hypocrisy around Joker is insane. The first movie was great. Yeah, it felt like Taxi Driver and uh, King of Comedy. whoop de freaking do You know how many movies that I've watched feel like Taxi Driver and King of Comedy? It's a legendary film. Of course movies are going to... I'm sorry, I'm getting so mad, but I like the first Joker. Maybe that's why I'm so frustrated, because... It's like they intentionally went against the first Joker and tore down all those ideas. And like, I, I kind of get what they're going for in a way. But ultimately, you're just spitting in the faces of fans. Like, what? Why would you do that? I don't understand. People are in this for a, a Joker movie, for a DC Joker. I like the idea of making that artistic. I like the idea of making that a little bit different. But don't completely go against the character and screw over fans of the comic books. And I saw Quentin Tarantino came out. He said he liked the Joker too because it spat in the faces of fans. I'm like, what are we doing here? The fans are the reason why you have the luxury of directing movies, right? It's not because, oh, you're very, you gotta send out the artistic vision and all that. Yeah, no, that's a part of it. 
But you ain't getting that budget, that $200 million budget, which I think is ridiculous. This movie should have cost $60 million. Maybe you had to rope Joaquin Phoenix into it because the script sucked. You ain't getting that without the fans. And this is the issue that I have with Hollywood. Sometimes you get filmmakers in movies and whoever's decision it was to say, yeah, screw the fans who supported our first movie. What? What? Stay in your lane, dude. That is not what it's all about. It's not. You're supposed to make people happy. I don't care what your stupid vision was. I don't care what your artistic merits are. Stupid. I'm putting it on the bad tier. It was meh. It's bad. Because the more I think about it, stupider it gets. All right, calm down, Austin. I'm struggling riding the struggle bus. How about Venom? <laughs> the fact that I think, the fact that I think that Venom is just like slightly better than Joker Folia Do is crazy. Like that's crazy because I thought for sure Folia Do could be the best comic book movie of the year. I was banking on it, man. I think I even bet on it being the best comic book movie of the year. I look. I don't know what to do or what to say about Venom 3 other than it's similar to the first two movies. It's not good. It's not a good movie. It's totally imbalanced. It doesn't know what it's trying to be. I think Tom Hardy's satisfied, but at the same time, I'm watching this going, I don't know if he wants to be here. I mean, I know he does, but does he? He says he does, but is he putting his full heart and soul into this? And people on Twitter making fan cams of the Venom-Eddie uh, Brock relationship. And I'm just like, eh, it's just not very good. It's not compelling. When we get that montage at the end of the film, I'm not going to say what it's all about, but I, I just didn't feel anything, to be honest with you. I'm just like, eh, okay. This franchise is kind of stupid. Look, I, it, it's maybe I had this vision of what Venom could have been, and ultimately that didn't come to fruition. Uh, and the movies aren't terrible. They're not. There's some fun moments. There's some hilarious moments. I love the banter, the back and forth between Eddie Brock and Venom. I think that's great. But the third movie doesn't focus on that. It gets away from that. That's why I'm coming around on the first one like, yeah, the first one was probably the best because that's the most simplistic. That's the one that does at least kind of what you want it to do, even though it doesn't lean heavy R-rated like I thought this franchise would have and should have. Yeah, he eats people's heads. All right. Ultimately, this film was all over the place. You got the government interference. You got the alien invasion. You got Noel sitting in that chair for 30 seconds, and that's all we get. Why'd they get Andy Serkis to play that character? My expectations were a lot higher from him. He did nothing. The alien invasion was fine. This franchise is fine. It's not very good. I'm debating, should I go bad or should I go meh? Because either way, it is better than Joker, and I guess I had a little more fun with it. I'm going to be nice to Venom 3. Look, it's probably a bad movie, but I'm going to say meh. Before I rank these movies, 21 films in October. Uh, for my sanity's sake, hopefully I don't see that many in November, but if you want to see a November countdown, a November ranking, dropping that thumbs up is the way to let me know that, as well as uh, what movies did I miss? Clearly at the bottom is Time Cut. Sorry, Time Cut, you suck. On the bad tier, I'm going to put Hellboy at the bottom, followed by, you know, I, I guess I gotta be a little nice to Joker. Mr. Crockett, and then Joker, because at least it was a beautiful movie to look at. The cinematography was gorgeous. How about the meh tier? Venom looks pretty good right That We'll say the Platform 2 is right next to it, and, you know, I'll be honest, I think I had a little more fun with Family Pack, so I'm gonna say Family Pack over Brothers. The, the board game concept's cool. On the OK tier, I was debating, uh, so I have to put Salem's Lot at the bottom of this one, and that looks okay. You know what? I'm gonna say Outside is a little more creative than Don't Move. And then here's the one that's gonna be challenging. I actually like Piece by Piece, where it is, followed by, we're gonna go Terrifier 3, Woman of the Hour next, and then just a little more engaging for me was It's What's Inside. How about, man, how about a really good one here in Smile 2? And then right now, I'm going to keep Conclave at the five spot on that good tier and The Shadow Strays at the top. What a fun film. On the great tier, this is tough, but I'm going to keep that Superman, uh, the Christopher Reeve story documentary in third place. In second place, I'm going to say a beautiful movie, uh, We Live in Time at number two, and an entertaining, great time with fun characters, and one that if you're an SNL fan, you almost have to watch. I'm not a fan of 
today's stuff, but I used to be a fan. Uh, I, I believe that's the best movie of the month. Now, again, there were some films that I didn't get to see. We have Anora, which is... I can't wait to see that finally coming to my area this weekend. We've got Here, which is officially uh, a November release. So some movies that could have made it a lot higher. Not saying Here would have, but I believe that's a solid top three. That being said, no awesome movies in October. Some greats, some goods, and a whole bunch of mediocre, but no awesome movies. I'm waiting on that next awesome film, man. Right now, my top ten stayed pretty stagnant through the last little bit. So we need something to come in and spice it up a little bit. What movie in November is that going to be? What movie in November do I have to see? Let me know that. Thanks so much for watching. Appreciate you big time. I'll be back with more reviews. Like I said, I'm going to see Anora this weekend. Stay tuned for that.